YouTube and welcome to my channel my name is Robert and today I am watching the internet historian the Costa Concordia um, because it is the 10th anniversary somewhat the disaster happened in January of 2012 it is now December 2022 so it's still you know 10 years several months almost 11 years not a problem I know of this shipwreck uh, it was in the news <laughs> quite a while bit but after that not too sure of all the other details I don't know the internet historians uh, other projects that he's done this was recommended to me by a friend so I thought I'd check it out and before we get into this if you'd like to support my channel feel free to subscribe it doesn't cost you anything it's totally free and it would really help me out hit the post notification bell when I drop new content you'll be notified give the video a thumbs up and feel free to leave a comment okay the internet historian the Costa Concordia disaster here we go <sighs> the Costa Concordia ship of dreams it's been eight years I can still smell the buffets from their five restaurants. The casino and three-story theater had hardly been used. Ah, the gym, the day spa, the sheets in her 1500 luxurious cabins hadn't even been slept in. Costa Concordia cost $570 million to build. And you could tell. You could really tell. I remember it like it was just a few years ago. We had left Civitavecchia, a port in Rome, and we were making our way to Savona. It was day two of our seven day journey. But that ship. I. she was cursed. Oh my god. When she premiered, the traditional bottle of champagne bounced right <laughs> off the side instead oh, of smashing. No, that's not a bad good. omen. But I'm not the superstitious. Nah, ladder. Nothing could go wrong on Friday the 13th of January 2012. Wow. On the 100th year anniversary of the Titanic. On a ship that's Boy, also that's only good. safety rated for two compartment flooding. Oh. Especially not when you have a five-star max-level captain, like Francisco Scatino. A man who mysteriously rose from head of security to the position of captain within just a couple of years. What? He knows exactly what to do in case of an emergency. For example, when he caused this emergency in 2008, when he crashed into a port in Sicily. And in 2010... Wait a minute. Back a little bit. For example, when he caused this emergency in 2008... Oh no. It's the Costa Concordia. <laughs> ...when he crashed into a port in Sicily. And in 2010, in Vanamon, Germany, when he was steering a different ship and came... There is no footage, so this is a scene from Speed 2 Cruise Control. Oh! <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, so that's not this. I'm into port too fast and caused another collision. I've got a good feeling about this. So let's set the scene. It's a beautiful evening. People are having fun on the slides, drinks at the bar. Antonio Magnotta is playing piano at the restaurant. Martin the Magician is setting up for his show. And the ship is setting up for a little detour. It's called a sail by salute. Basically, you get real close to the shore and honk the horn. The locals hate it, but the customers love it, and it's a tradition. Scatino, the captain, comes into the dining hall with the lady. 
Dominika Samorton. Remember this face because you'll be seeing a lot of it later. Scatino eats his dinner with her and socializes for a little while. Then he, Dominica, and the maitre d' finish up and excuse themselves. They're heading to the bridge. It's time for that sail-by salute. This time, they're going to get closer than ever. Just 1,500 feet from the island of Giglio. And how are they going to determine this distance? Well, of course, the captain is going to eyeball it. What? Apparently, it's not an uncommon thing to do. Scatino turns to the fella steering, his helmsman. Jacob Rusleybin. First interesting tidbit. Costa Crochier has hired Jacob from Indonesia at a rock bottom price. And he's a bit of a newbie to the job. In fact, his profession hitherto, a painter and a cleaner. It's his first time steering a- Wait. How is he a helmsman? A painter and a cleaner. At the helm. Oh boy. A massive ship, and he's very excited. At least, we think he is. It's hard to tell because he doesn't speak English or Italian very well at all. What? Off to a good start. Okay, wait. No experience as a helmsman. And doesn't speak English or Italian. How'd he get the job? The second in command orders the helmsman to 290. Now, don't be confused by these numbers, they're just the degrees on a compass. At the same time, the captain whips out his cell phone and calls former captain Mario Palombo, who lives on the island. They chat about the safe distance. Okay, Mario is the reason for the cell by salute. He essentially came up with the idea he's not on at the time he's in. Okay. All right. Distance to Giglio's shores. It's all very casual. Anyway, Mario says that the safe distance is between 0.3 and 0.4 miles from shore. The captain is going all in. This is not his first sail by salute, so he's confident in what he's doing. We're going closer than we've ever been before. The captain's eyeballing it again. Hmm. New heading of 300, he tells the helmsman. Downstairs, Martin is about to cut his assistant in half. And of course, that means that there's already a lady inside this box. She's waiting for the cue, and then she'll poke her legs out. Yeah. The captain... Um, allegedly, that's how the trick works. There's two women. And I think they're both contortionists. I could be wrong. Okay. Martin is giving more orders. Pulling gently to 310. Increase speed to 16 knots. Oh. Going this fast is going to be a fatal error. But before we talk about that, let's talk about another big problem. Language barrier. You because think? at this point, the captain says, 325. But the helmsman relays, 315. So the first officer intervenes and he goes, no, 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 335, which is also wrong. And then the captain clarifies, no, 325. The helmsman confirms 325. Their poor communication has them moving at a much wider angle than they think they are. However, the captain should and would know this, except for the next problem, complacency about procedure. The standard procedure of a ship this large is for the third officer to give exact positional coordinates every time the captain gives a new directional order. But they're not doing that. Oh, wow. 3.30, he says. The helmsman relays 3.30. The ship reaches 16 knots. The captain then turns to the second officer and instructs him to go to the left wing. That's these things here, and they basically exist so you can get a better view over the whole vessel. Okay. A few seconds pass, and then the mood starts to turn. Scatino notices white foam of waves breaking against the rocks directly in front of him in the distance. The Costa Concordia right now is on what? Holy shit. Almost 700 meters closer to the rocks than it should be, without deviation. The rocks were actually underwater. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. There is going to be a direct collision. Oh, shit! Scatino yeah. immediately commands the ship to start turning away. 335! Not enough. The captain shouts, 340! 
The captain yells, 350. Now, remember how I said that accelerating to 16 knots was a fatal error? Well, that's because it's made this ship incapable of such a drastic turn. What they've got is understeer. Here's an example. The front end is not working. You're turning, 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 and you're just going straight. You want to go over here, but you're going to end up over here. So despite the order of 350, right now the bow is still only pointing at 327. Not nearly enough to miss the rock. And oh no, it's about to get worse. That language barrier again. In these critical moments where every second counts, the helmsman wrongly relays 340. The captain snaps back, 350, starboard, or we end up on the rocks. The third officer goes to assist the helmsman. Now, don't get confused by the orders from here. We're changing over to rudder instructions. The captain yells, starboard 10, starboard 20, and still, it's not enough. Hard to starboard. That means as hard as it'll go. But at this point, even if they clear these rocks, they need to get the rest of the ship to swing around it. So the captain yells, midship which centers the rudder. The bow is now less than 150 meters from Skull Rock. Port 10. But the helmsman only gets to port 5 before another order is given two seconds later. Port 20. They might just avoid disaster here, maybe. But then, oh no. One more time, the helmsman cocks up at the worst possible moment. The helmsman goes to starboard instead of port, oh, undoing no. the swing. Eight seconds later, he realizes the error and corrects, but it's too late. He has just turned a probable near miss into a sure hit. All wow. they can do now is hold on as the bow of the ship narrowly passes by the rocks. Hard to port. The second officer yells, we're going to hit. Collision. hits rocks on the port side. A 53 meter gash opens up in the hull. 53 meters. Wow. That's monstrous. <laughs> and thousands of tons of water begin pouring in. A loud scraping and bang is heard by all passengers. At the helm, there's panic. Rumblings in the dining room. Martin awkwardly pauses his act as he's helping his assistant into the box. Meanwhile, the lady inside let me out, let me is out, trapped let me out. and terrified. There's confusion across the ship. All of the crew off shift come back on duty. All officers run to the bridge. Technical crews run down to the lower decks to assess damage. On connection with the rocks, they lose propulsion and slow to 8.3 knots. And they are now adrift. Close the watertight doors at stern. Enormous volumes of water are pouring in. So much so that within 29 seconds of collision, all six engines stop working through flooding. 22 seconds later, a blackout happens. Lights, electrics, the water pumps too. Everything. The captain orders the helmsman hard starboard. This is the final position of the rudder before power to that too is lost. The Costa Concordia, now without power, is drifting starboard. Plunged into absolute darkness. A quick breakdown of the flooding. When the Concordia struck land, it tore open three watertight compartments. Oh, great. At first, compartment five, which filled very rapidly. Then six, more slowly, four shortly after. Then seven, eight, and three. Modern ships are built to withstand two compartment breaches. These compartments especially, though, are a problem. It hit in the worst possible location. The engine room. Wow because they contain the engines and the electrics. These main generators give power to the whole ship, from propulsion motors to rudder to hotel functions, pretty much everything. When they went out, the ship was a functionless sinking cage. Mm. A few seconds later, the emergency batteries for internal lighting and communications kick off. When the lights come back on, Martin has vanished. 
please ditch the stage. And it caused a huge panic in the theatre, as passengers are trying to flee to their cabins and to muster stations. People already in their cabins come out and start putting on life vests. Staff rally and try to calm everyone down. Everything is fine. There's no need for vests. Please return to your cabins. The emergency generator starts. All of the watertight doors close except for door 12, which is jammed. The captain calls Pilot, the chief engineer, as the ship begins to list on the port side. There's water coming in? Yes, there's water. But where? The engine room. But a lot of water? Yes! There's water, you can't go down. Let's go down the other side. In a moment we'll start the pumps, I'll let you know. In the theatre, the whole magic box apparatus slides right off the stage and falls into the crowd, further increasing panic. On the bridge, an announcement is being prepared. They are going to lie to prevent a panic. Let's just say we have a blackout. The deputy chief engineer enters the engine control room. He confirms to the bridge that at least compartments 5, 6 and 7 are flooded. Announcements are made. The captain to inform you that due to an electrical fault which is currently under control we're currently in a blackout our technicians are working to resolve the situation and we'll inform you of developments as they occur thank you for your attention coincidentally at the same time in the restaurant they're playing my heart will go on and it's very much not helping the situation the captain calls the costa crisis unit Roberto Ferrarini. He tells the crisis unit that they've hit a rock, that they're assessing damages and that they are also in a blackout. The crisis office says to reverse the ship up onto shore. Well, how are you going to do that? You don't have power to the rudder, let alone the engine. You know, hoist the sails? Yeah. Anyway, around this time, the wind direction creates a starboard list, and the ship begins to turn anyway, drifting right back towards the shore. Which is a very good thing, because you want the ship to end up as close to shore as possible. Exactly. A panicked passenger senses that something is off. This isn't like any electrical problem that she's ever seen. Plus, there was a massive crashing noise and now the ship is tilting. So, she contacts her daughter in Italy. The daughter then calls the police. And the police call the harbour master. While that goes on, a conversation between Pilon and Ambrosio. The diesel is not starting. The captain asks the engine room, but where have we made contact? Thinking that the incoming water can be reduced. Captain, here everything is lost. The electrical panel, everything. They're saying at this point that the ship is going down. The captain calls Roberto Ferrarini again. Uh, actually, two compartments have been flooded, but don't worry, the ship's stability isn't in danger. Wrong. Passengers begin going to muster stations on their own initiative. The cruise director says, we have a lot of people at muster stations that I do not want to fall overboard. Do we make an announcement to tell them to go to the lounges? Bozio says, I think that's best. The harbour master from Livorno calls the ship. The captain tells them that we, we just have a blackout. How long has this blackout been going on? About 20 minutes. Have you asked passengers to put on life vests? It's just a blackout. I, I've got to go. The harbour master oh. is suspicious. He says to his superiors that he thinks something more is going on. He calls a patrol boat to the area and asks them to look at the ship. Another problem. The fan on the emergency diesel generator isn't working properly. Pilon manually has to turn the thing on and off with a screwdriver so that it doesn't overheat and cause a fire. The captain is on the phone to the lower decks asking pointless questions like, is it still flooded? Yes. Yes, it is. The captain is essentially in denial of the situation. The harbour master calls again. Finally, he says, the ship is taking on water through an opening in the left side and the ship is listing. He qualifies with, no one dead or injured. The harbour master asks if he needs help. Just a tugboat. When in reality, they need a full rescue. With three compartments flooded, the captain finally realises that things are really bad and they are not going to improve. The Coast Guard orders every available ship to the scene. Meanwhile, up with the passengers, the cruise director's assistant says, uh, everything's under control. Please return to your cabins or hang about in the lounges, no problem. She said this despite knowing it was wrong and that it further endangered lives. Most passengers at this point, though, aren't listening to this nonsense and they're busy figuring out how to abandon ship. Right. Bing, 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 bing. Local television has already picked up the story and they begin broadcasting live radio feed from the bridge. Hey, Capo. Captain, the passengers are going on board the boats. Okay, let them go to shore. So then general emergency? Wait, nah. let me talk to Ferrarini. 
We risk the emergency generators that do not have cooling. It has cooling problems, 100 degrees. The cooling fan has stopped. Pilon calls the bridge and tells the safety officer they need to evacuate. The safety officer relays this to the captain, but after no response, he orders the engine room to evacuate on his own. The captain says, no, stay. We'll leave it. So what do we do? General emergency? The captain tells Ferrarini that he's abandoning ship. Abandoned ship. Another announcement is made. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. The situation is under control. Please remain calm. But at this time, proceed to your station. They're located outside on deck four. The Livorno Coast Guard calls again. The captain declares distress. The Coast Guard officially calls for rescue operations. They contact Pietro Mille, the helicopter base commander, who then calls in every available pilot as he rushes down to the helicopter base. Pilon shuts down the emergency generator for the final time. The first rescue vessel arrives. By this point, the lifeboats are already going. Luckily, the ship is very close to shore. Wow. Oh, perhaps too close to shore. The ship forcefully runs aground, creating an uneven center of gravity and it begins heavily listing starboard. The captain issues a general emergency on board. The announcement to abandon ship is finally called and alarms ring out. And with that comes panic. And now that they're listing, with many of the lifeboats too awkwardly positioned to enter the water, there aren't enough readily available and they have to start going back and forth to the shore, picking people up and dropping them off. The patrol boats report to the Livorno Harbour Master that the ship has run aground and is listing heavily. So the harbour master asks the captain about it, and the captain says, no, 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 the ship is still floating. Uh, in fact, we're trying to manoeuvre it onto the shore. They know he's lying. Hold on, I'm reversing it. Beep, 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 beep. The captain then says to beep, bottom beep, out beep, the beep, starboard beep. anchor. <laughs> so they drop out the anchors, but let out too much chain, effectively rendering them useless. The deputy mayor of Giglio, Mario Pellegrini, and tobacco shop owner Giovanni Rossi arrive at the harbour. They watch the scene unfold. As the first of the lifeboats arrive on shore, the deputy mayor takes the initiative and races to board one of the lifeboats, returning to the ship, and starts trying to find someone in charge. He gives up and starts helping passengers. Scatino tells everyone to leave and take radios, but not before changing out of his uniform and into a nice suit. Priorities. Dimitri Christidis and Silvia Koronica leave with him. The maitre d' and Samort can both get out of there. By this point, approximately 300 people are still on the ship. Millet reaches the helicopter base. He's not supposed to do that. He's supposed to be the last one. Oh my goodness. The first helicopter, a slow-moving Augusta Bell, was already rising from the tarmac for the hour-long flight south. Bozio is the last crew member left on the bridge, coordinating evacuation. He then leaves to help passengers board lifeboats. The bridge is now abandoned. And then, the ship's black box stops working. Apparently there were technical problems with it. That means, from here, things are going to get a little foggy in detail. A while later, rescue helicopters arrive, but they're struggling to find the ship because they're expecting it to still be well above water. Passengers are scaling down the port side by ladder as lifeboats return to pick them up. This is no, no joke. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was no, no joke anymore. Uh, yes. You're not allowed to make a film uh, movie. I'm allowed, I'm allowed. Who say you are? A second helicopter, a faster model. Who is she to tell him that he can't film? <laughs> Someone's got delusions of grandeur. Ha! Sets off. The ship stops healing and comes to a final resting place. Now the Coast Guard calls the captain because he's just learnt that the captain has abandoned ship. The captain claims, uh, uh, no, actually I slipped and I fell into one of the lifeboats. Ooh, I'm a klutz. But now that I'm on board, I, I may as well head back to shore. DeFelco tells the captain to get the fuck back on board. And the captain kind of acts confused and then effectively refuses. So the captain makes it to shore. From here, we only have mainstream news reports to rely on, so it's not going to be super accurate. But they say that Giglio's police chief then finds 110 survivors on the rocks at Point Gabianara. And among them is the captain. It's not known whether the captain helped anyone while he was there. And in fact, the police chief claimed that he just sat on the rocks and watched other people do the rescuing. 
A while later, a rescue boat picks up the captain and takes him to the harbour. He speaks to the police. He then finds the ship's onboard chaplain, Father Rafael Molina, and cry to him for about 15 minutes. Then he goes to the harbour master's office to receive probably the biggest dressing down of his entire life. Port authorities ask the taxi driver to take the captain back to his hotel. The captain takes the 30-second cab ride to the Bahamas Hotel. According to the cabbie, he was beaten like a dog. He was cold and afraid. He only asked me where he could buy a pair of fresh socks. <laughs> but then he perked right up again and gave an interview to a news crew. He told them that he was the last to leave. The captain is usually the last to abandon ship. What happened, Captain? We were the last to leave the ship. All day Saturday, rescue a search for people on the ship. On Sunday morning, a South Korean couple is found in their cabin, safe but shivering. They had slept through the crash and woke up unable to exit their cabin. The last survivor, Manrico Giampandroni, was found with a broken leg. He was the cabin service director. In the end, 32 people died. The oh. 33, including a salvage worker who died in an accident on the ship two years later during the recovery. Oh, wow. Okay. The final body wasn't discovered until nearly three years later. Oh. A crew member, Russell Rebello, and it's believed that he died a hero helping passengers off the ship. Wow. The Costa Concordia was the largest cruise ship disaster since the Titanic. Mm. And then there's the ship. This is what happens to a 110,000 ton cruise liner when it's left half rolled over in the ocean. this isn't the end. It's just the halfway point. What most people know is that the Costa Concordia had crashed, many dead, and that the captain abandoned ship like a coward. But there's a whole veritable spaghetti of details to untangle. Let's dive in. What? There they are. The deets. The deets. <laughs> what? Box time. The Costa Concordia was more than just a floating resort. There's a mall, a casino, cha-ching, cha-ching. This iron chest was full of safes and cash registers and expensive fittings. And there were plenty of gamers prepared to sneak by authorities and try their luck in the hot zone. Within days, police divers reported that valuable items, once seen lying around the ship, were now missing. High-end liquor, expensive furniture, dining sets, cash from the casino, cash registers, jewellery and display cabinets, safes, Japanese woodblock prints by famous 18th century artists, <laughs> as well as the iconic bell, which hung from the bridge of the ship. It was never found. <laughs> Who steals a big fuck-off bell? Yes. Even the server admins were getting involved. Four divers who were part of the company contracted to refloat the Concordia were spotted on CCTV, sneaking out to the ship. A patrol boat was dispatched, and the men were caught inside the fancy suites with rucksacks full of stolen goods. The four men are charged with stealing and thieving and pinching. Later on, stolen as well as legitimate items found their way to Amazon and eBay. Chips from the casino, postcards, and cabin access cards became highly sought after souvenirs. It even has a watermark. Some Australian guy even made a listing for the ship itself, advertising it as buyer to collect. Buyer to collect. And although there were plenty of bidders, eBay pulled the plug. Yeah. I know you want to see Scatino go to jail, and we'll get to that. But first, 
we have to talk about someone else. Domnica Samorton. That was a close one. There was speculation that she was on the bridge that evening because she was the captain's mistress. Tense media speculation reports that her presence distracted the captain. They both denied their love for years and maintained that they were just friends. Although she did later admit to the media that she found him handsome. And how could you not? You so fucking precious when you smile. But she says there was no romantic link between them. Some people would like to believe, they want to know I have something with him, it's more interesting, it's like, you know, some spicy, spicy. in the story. Miss Morton also loved the spotlight, however. Oh, everyone! Oh, look! And took several interviews. Oh, shit. But as the pressure mounted upon her, she began making ominous threats to Scatino, saying he must confess and that you have but one week to come clean. But things from here get weird. Spicy. Sir Morton is a bit of a wild card. <laughs> In a subsequent interview, she claimed a helicopter came to the ship well before the other rescue craft to take away a package. Huh? And what was that package? Drugs, apparently. <laughs> so rumors began that the ship was running narcotics for the mafia. And not without cause, a number of cruise ships, even recently, have been caught trafficking drugs. As an aside, Scudino was tested for drugs immediately after the crash. He tested negative for drugs in his system, but trace amounts of cocaine were found in a hair sample. Makes it smoother and less dry. Nonetheless, the Concordia was searched and no drugs were reportedly ever found. How did we get here? Oh right, a helicopter. Sir Morton commented on it again the next day and said, actually, that helicopter was just for the captain as a means of evacuation from the ship. Okay, wait. So she expected to get some sort of first-class rescue while everyone else was still stuck on the ship? Mm. Wait, how did we get here? Oh, right. Sex with the captain. Play, 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 play. Divers were quick to head to the captain's cabin where they found Miss Sir Morton's lingerie and other articles of clothing as well as a makeup bag. The jig was up, but they continued denying it. Sir Morton mostly faded from international attention until she was told to appear before the court to present witness testimony. The judge pressed her to be truthful about their relationship, or she would be held in contempt. Either tell me the truth or shut up. So finally, she admitted it. She, yes, I had a sentimental relationship with the captain. Stop. But now, stop asking about my private life. She was indeed the captain's lover. What is up, Troubler Nation? What's it he know? She did this wife with C. Morton. Oh my god! She and Scatino had been having an affair for several weeks. She also said that on the night she boarded, she didn't have a ticket. Ticket, please. And didn't need to pay because nobody questions you when you're the captain's lover. Naturally, she gave another confusing interview after leaving court. I want to say that today is the second time I die because the first time I die in the night of the crush with my psychological brain and what? problems. And today I die the second time because, of course, people <laughs> find out something that I try to hide. Subsequent to the trial, she used her fame in Moldova to become a political activist, often appearing on television and radio and in articles covering protests, accompanied by pictures of her being arrested by police. It was some stuff about victims of violence, women's rights, Girl power. yada yada yada, and interestingly, part of a push to block the sale of shares of Moldova's train network to Russia. Sure, sure. Other than that, I don't really know what she's been up to. Let me just check on her ins. Oh God, not again. Civil Several civil suits were quickly lodged against Costa Crociere, and their parent company, Carnival Cruises, immediately saw a share drop of 23%. Passengers sought compensation for their damaged mental health, lost belongings, and loved ones. Either they allowed him to divert from his course, or they didn't know 
where their billion dollar ship was. Within a few days, facing financial and media pressure, the CEO attempted to join the bandwagon against the captain and the crew. That was not the ordinary route that the ship was taking at the time and, and was not only taking, but the time the, the ship Today, was... Junior! Claiming that the ship was not approved to deviate from the route. But that wasn't true. Approval isn't required if the ship is deviating by less than 15 miles, or that it was against company rules. Also untrue, because investigators found that they didn't have any rules about deviating route, and they tacitly encouraged sail-by-salutes. Now, in response to the civil suits, Costa Crociere offered passengers 11,000 euros each as compensation. That's kind of small. 11,000 euros, about $14,000, is the minimum compensation under international law when a ship is abandoned. This was to reimburse them for their tickets, as well as any costs they accrued in having to unexpectedly travel home early. And that was supposed to release them from everything and anything that has to do with this accident. I cannot ask for more than this. A lot of passengers, understandably, were not too happy with this deal, and they refused to take the money. We think the offer is an insult for what these poor passengers went through. We think that the compensation being offered is not commensurate. Yeah. Here. Take it. Go ahead. Compensation being offered is not commensurate. Later. Costa Crociere would lodge a plea deal with the Tuscany court to pay a 1 million euro fine to avoid a criminal trial. The judge agrees. Costa Crociere is now off the hook for all criminal liability for the whole thing. They've washed their hands of the incident and flecked the residual droplets of responsibility onto the faces of six staff members. Passengers and relatives of the dead are livid that the company has been able to avoid criminal responsibility. Offered is not commensurate. Civil suits against the company continue. By the way, the residents of the island of Giglio also banded together and sought damages. They didn't get much. Eventually, passengers who refused the initial compensation of 11,000 joined civil parties against Scatino in his trial in 2015. It's not commensurate. They were awarded 30,000 euros each. Other cases, especially those involving lost relatives, are settled for undisclosed amount. <laughs> New York attorney Peter René travelled to Budapest to represent six real survivors of the disaster. At René and René, we personally work on every case. And we'll work harder than anyone to get you the most money possible in the shortest amount of time. And while on the job, a seventh case cropped up via mail. email. An elderly woman, a loner, said, Help me, Mr. Ronai, for I have lost my daughter, Eva, and my five-year-old granddaughter, Roxana. So Mr. Ronai agreed to speak with her. Oh, wow. However, there were some inconsistencies in her story. Neither Eva nor Roxana were on the passenger list. Oh. Odd. But Costa is known for having stowaways. Still, Mr. Renai was suspicious. They wouldn't cheaty old Petey, would they? Renai inquired further about why she was on board, especially without a ticket. Ilona said, Well, I don't know, but you should ask her boyfriend. Zolt Horvath. He'll know all the details. I'm up all night. I'm going crazy, he said. But Mr. Renai was still suspicious. Because then she asked, How much money do you think this is worth? Uh... This is a huge red flag, Petey. In 20 years of doing this, you've never had anyone ask about money. Why now? So Mr. Renai hired an investigator and sent photos around of the missing girl. The next day, the phone rang. Oh, hoi, hoi. It was the boyfriend again. Ah, uh, look, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding and the child isn't missing at all. Uh-huh. And then he claimed he was confused because he had done too many drugs the night before. Oh. Okay, can I speak to the daughter then? At first, he was refused. So Renai said that he'd have to file a missing persons report to the police if he couldn't. The boyfriend relented. That night, Renai met with Zolt and brought the police with him. He speaks to the granddaughter and asks her if she's seen mum. Yeah, I saw her today. Oh, really? Yeah, we went to the park today and we went on the swings. Oh no, the jig was up. So the mum walks into the room sheepishly. It's a miracle. And the story changed again. Okay, I'm not dead, but I did injure me leg when I jumped from the ship. And then I immediately flew back to Budapest. 
Although, don't worry about checking my leg because there are no visible marks or injuries. Uh, old PD, I'm beginning to think they weren't even on the boat. Also, it turns out this lady isn't her mom, it's just a neighbor. Eventually, Renee managed to make the pair confess. And then they said, hey, we haven't done anything wrong. We haven't taken any money. And in the end, it looks like there'll be no criminal punishment for the scam because Hungary, a former communist country, has no laws against insurance fraud on the books. The law firm that never sleeps, call 1-800-664-7. Oh, that's a bad idea. Oh, that's a very bad idea. <laughs> Mario, would you teach me some Italian? Oh, of course. Get back on board for fuck's sake. Okay, thanks. Gregorio <laughs> de Felder, the naval officer who shouted at Scatino to Vada a bordo caso, became a bit of a national hero overnight in Italy. He, like the rest of the world, expected Scatino to go down with the ship. And when the captain chickened out, De Falco was there to admonish him. And when he stopped answering the radio, he called him on his cell phone to continue putting him on blast. When the captain first reported just a blackout, De Falco didn't believe the story and immediately began preparing a rescue effort, which likely saved several lives. His actions were applauded by most Italians who were tired of their public servants being corrupt and avoiding responsibility. Accordingly, shirts sporting Vada a bordo caso were being printed by the end of the week, others setting it as their phone's ringtone. But then, in September 2014, without warning, De Falco was transferred to an admin role in the Coast Guard. Hear what I said, he'd been demoted. De Falco said that he had been passed up for promotion, that he had also not been told which admin office he was even being transferred to, and that it all effectively cancelled 10 years of his career. De Falco wow. was tres furioso, and there was public speculation that it was owing to bad blood between himself and Admiral Delano, his former boss. His status among the public overshadowed his superior in many ways. On the other hand, his boss said, ah, no, it's part of a normal career progression for naval officers and that he must show more maturity and professionalism to advance his career. Now, it's hard to know what's true in office politics, so let's leave that alone. And anyway, in 2018, De Falco said buenas noches, ya later, to the Italian Navy to become a politician. In March that year, he was elected to the Italian Senate, serving as a member for Livorno. He still serves there today. I'm the company. The day after the disaster, Scatino was taken into custody by police and underwent questioning. However, it was clear that this would not be a straightforward investigation. So the judge released him under house arrest at his home in Sorrento, a town in Napoli. By July of that year, the house arrest was relaxed and he was allowed within this general area. While under house arrest, he wrote a book with this journalist from Rai magazine. I have no idea what it says, I don't speak Italian. But goddammit, he must have some kind of charisma going on, because there's been a lot of speculation in the press that he had an affair with her as well. He can't keep getting away with it! Hold on, I got it, I got it. Not content with abandoning his ship, this dude is determined to abandon his wife as well. Oh, so, Scatino and five others are facing criminal charges. Right. Straight away, everyone lodges a plea bargain with the court. And all of those plea bargains are accepted, except for Scatino's. And the condition of everyone's reduced sentences are that they must provide witness testimony against Scatino. He touched me. Ciro, Jacob and Sylvia were all given suspended sentences. Okay. Two years, ten months. One year, eight months. One year, six months. Oh, wow. Okay. Roberto and Manrico are able... Hotel director. Crisis. Wait a minute. Co the Costa Crisis Unit Roberto Federini got one year and 11 months for in jail? 
did he really do anything wrong? And the hotel director. Uh. Okay. Able to opt for community service or house arrest. Not a bad deal. A good deal. A good deal. And that meant that Scatino was now all on his own. Ciro, the first officer, was the first to give his testimony. On the witness stand, he claimed that Scatino was distracted by his mistress and other guests on the bridge. <laughs> that there was confusion over who was in command. Then it was Jacob's turn. And he said, Lamau XD, because he didn't actually bother with his testimony or his reduced sentence. He just fled the country. It took authorities 12 months to eventually track him down on the outskirts of Jakarta. And when they said, Oi, we still want that witness testimony. He just scalped again. Huh. And he hasn't been found since. Wow. After that, Ferrarini gave his testimony. Then, so, uh, look, we don't have time to relitigate the whole trial. So let's just go straight to the verdict. Guilty! Scatino That's was found guilty of multiple manslaughter, causing a shipwreck, abandoning ship, and lying to authorities. Mm -hmm. He is sentenced to 16 years and one month in prison. Wow. But wait, oh. there's still the appeals. The appeals trial begins. And the verdict on the appeal? Surprise! Rejected! Mm -hmm. So Scatino's lawyers appealed again. And the verdict on the final appeal? Scatino made multiple attempts to secure a plea deal, but was denied by the prosecution each time. The prosecution called for Scatino to be sentenced to 26 years in prison, calling the incident a titanic affair. Oh, okay, I see what you did there. Scatino was not present. His lawyer stated that he was waiting outside of the jail for the ruling, so that if his plea was rejected, he could immediately start serving his sentence. Hmm. And with that, five years and four months after the disaster, he was finally in a cell. The salvage operation was enormous. It took over two years and cost an estimated $1.2 billion. Beginning in early 2012, they first spent two months pumping fuel from the ship's tanks. At the same time, they had to pump seawater in so that the balance wasn't affected and the ship didn't slide around. Yeah. In early 2013, a platform was built under the ship to prevent it from falling further. Sponsons were then attached to the sides of the ship and cables attached to the underwater platform. The sponsons were then dragged underwater and opened up to allow the ocean to fill them. The ship could then roll over properly. By late 2013, the ship was upright once more. The sponsons were then attached to the side of the ship to help keep it balanced. It now rested partially above water and crews could walk around safely. By July 2014, the water was removed from the sponsons and compressed air was pumped in to lift the ship. And she was ready to cruise again. This time to a port in Genoa. It was a four-day towing journey to the docks where a two-year process of dismantling and recycling would begin. Two years. That same weekend of the towing, Scatino was busy. He was the guest of honor at a white party on an island in the Bay of Naples. He appeared on the front page of a local newspaper, flanked by two of Italy's most eligible bachelorettes. That's disgusting. Oh. Well, holy shit. That was much worse than I thought it was. Like, the... Like, how... How do you... Like, you know, um, great that they hired the helmsman. Uh, unfortunate that he was unable to speak the language, the, the Italian or the English. That's just, that's, you know, ugh. But then again, you know, the, what was it, the third officer was supposed to do her job. Allegedly, she didn't do it. Yeah, I, then this drive-by salute BS, that's just unnecessary. But, oh well. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's just amazing. Amazing. 
story. I'm glad I watched it. And some more insight into this incident and just total human error. The ship hit the rocks in the absolute worst location. The engine room flooded. All the electrical, just, oh, just the worst location for that to happen. Unfortunately, 33 people lost their lives. That's uh, really, uh, you know, totally unnecessary. Well, I hope you enjoyed that just as much as I did. I found it very informative. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Have a great day. Goodbye.